Hey there students. Today's lecture is going to be on the wars of Louis the 14th and speaking of wars and fighting and all that quick shout out to the fencing team at Flowery Branch High School in Atlanta, Georgia. Very glad to have visited your school and have gotten a really cool t-shirt so thank you Miss Pizzino's class. As we look at the wars of Louis the 14th, we first have to consider the presence for the first time in early modern Europe of standing armies. The absolutists tended to build up these large standing armies. Louis built up a standing army of over 400,000 men, which was unprecedented. And what we have here is that Louis is really trying to turn France into a permanent war-making state as opposed to before this when largely monarchs would declare war and then raise an army. Now of course this is going to increase the amount of warfare in Europe because if you've got an army this size you're going to use it. You're going to be more likely to try to employ it in battle to try to achieve your personal and dynastic and national aims. And Louis's wars had a dramatic effect on the balance of power at the turn of the 18th century in Europe. Before this, the Habsburgs dominated Europe. If you look at this map from the age of the Reformation, you see Habsburgs in Austria, in Spain, in the Holy Roman Empire, in southern Italy, in the Netherlands, here a Habsburg, there a Habsburg, everywhere a Habsburg. And Louis's wars are going to decrease the influence that the Habsburgs had on the balance of power in Europe. Now, when we look at Louis XIV's wars, there are four. The War of Devolution, the Dutch War, the Nine Years' War, and the War of the Spanish Succession. And two of these wars, I'm going to especially emphasize these being the Dutch War and the War of the Spanish Succession. So his objectives, when Louis XIV went to war, he sought to do four things. He sought to conquer new territory. He wanted to achieve French dominance in Europe. He wanted to weaken rivals. And, of course, he wanted personal glory. The fourth of these is the most controversial. Now, of course, Voltaire, the Enlightenment historian and writer, said he did not separate his own glory from the advantage of France. Every king who loves glory loves the public good. So while some people would fault Louis for his ambition and his vainglorious personal motives, Voltaire saw this as, well, Louis is advancing France through advancing himself, that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive aims to make Louis look great and to make France look great. But, again, that's a subject of controversy and discussion among historians. Now, the targets of Louis's wars were almost universally the Habsburgs and the Dutch, that he was looking at these two powers that he wanted France to replace. The first of Louis's wars was the War of Devolution, in which Louis gained territories in the Spanish Netherlands, today known as Belgium, and Franche Comte. I think that I got that right working on my French, pr French pronunciations, even though it is a written test, but I know people are watching in Europe, so hopefully I didn't slaughter that too much. And during this war, when Louis is fighting against the Dutch, he negotiates the secret treaty of Dover with the English and Scottish monarch Charles II. And in this secret treaty of Dover, they are going to double-team the Dutch. Charles, who had money problems, was going to get money from Louis in return for his naval resources, that the British really had the only navy in Europe at the time that could rival the Dutch naval power. So Charles gets some money and Louis gets a navy to help him in this war. And then we get to the Franco-Dutch War. This is the war between Louis and the Dutch Republic, lasted from 1672 to 1678. Now, keep in mind that this is Louis XIV, the king of the largest, most powerful, unified state of France, versus the Dutch Republic, which was, at the time, really just a conglomeration, really a confederation of 
different provinces, which I've made a video about, uh, which you're welcome to watch. But this is a very large unified state versus a very small fragmented confederation. And at first, this war didn't go very well for the Dutch at all. The first year of this war, 1672, in the Netherlands was known as Rampjaar which was the disaster year, the year of disaster. Thank you so much, Lisa, for helping me with my Dutch pronunciation. And as you can see here in this painting, which I had the privilege of seeing when I was in the Netherlands last summer, the Dutch had a very striking change of leadership. One of the people you see here is Johan de Witt, who had been the primary minister of the government. And he and his brother were brutally executed, and their remains were displayed upside down for everyone to see. Now, ironically, de Witt has a statue right there near the, in Den Haag, near the Parliament building in the Netherlands, which uh, is incredibly interesting to me. There are a couple of statues of people who were executed right there in the capital. And so part of this Dutch change in leadership was the appointment of William III, the Prince of Orange, as Stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Gelderland, and over Isel. And the Dutch had just gone through a Stadtholderless period, and the Stadtholder was a very complex leadership position, kind of the rug that ties the room together, the glue that holds the whole thing together. This was a civil and military leader and kind of a controversial position because there were people, especially in Holland, who didn't want this filled. But this emergency necessitated the reappointment of the Stadtholder. So William III is going to direct the war against Louis XIV, which is really a war for the very survival of the Dutch Republic. And knowing that he can't meet Louis on the battlefield, he can't match Louis man for man or army for army or anything like that, it's flood time. And the Dutch employ really what is a natural resource that the Netherlands, kind of like the New Orleans of Europe, a lot of it is below sea level. A lot of people in the Netherlands actually live on reclaimed land, land that was initially below sea level and underwater. And, you know, I read that Dutch engineers actually went to New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And what you see happen here is the Dutch are going to flood their country intentionally in order to save it from Louis. The old Dutch waterline is let loose and, you know, they are flooding farms, houses, uh, possibly even cities. But the thing is that the alternative is Louis taking over the Dutch Republic. So drastic times call for drastic measures. And the Dutch also had naval superiority under the leadership of Admiral Michiel de Ruyter. Let me try that again. Michiel de Ruyter. Thanks again, Lisa. And this guy is a legend in the Dutch Republic. He looks a little like Peter the Great, which I think that that is a great way to gauge how legendary somebody was in history, right? But Admiral de Ruyter is a hero that anybody in the Netherlands who's educated in history knows who this guy is. Uh, the, yeah, the rigging, I think. Oh, wow, this is like Master and Commander. Like, I'm like, woo, I'm on a ship. And the result of this war was that Louis did gain cities from the Spanish Netherlands, but he did not conquer the Dutch Republic. And the Dutch Republic began a period of decline. This marks the end of the Dutch Golden Age, that although the Dutch were able to survive, they were no longer able to thrive after this because of the massive debts that they had to take on in order to fight the most powerful monarch in Europe. But then, there's a game changer. In the aftermath of the Franco-Dutch War, we have the Glorious Revolution of 1688 in England. And what happens here is that William III and Mary II are invited to rule in England, that King James II is run off the throne, and now we see that William III, yes, he should look familiar, the stadtholder of the... Dutch Republic, and now he is also the King of England. William III and Mary II were both grandchildren of 
Charles I, the English and Scottish monarch. So lot, lots of lots of inbreeding in these stories about the wars of Louis XIV. We'll get to more of that later. And so when this happens, what we see is an Anglo-Dutch alliance against Louis XIV, that Louis XIV can no longer count on the English Navy. He's got to then have the English Navy against him. And the British join this grand alliance. I'll use these interchangeably because it's during this time that you know England and Scotland will actually join a few years after this. So sorry for those of you in the UK, I'm interchanging, but I'm interchanging by design because Britain does not really exist yet at this time. So Britain, Austria, Prussia, the Dutch Republic, Portugal, and Savoy unite against Louis XIV, and Louis's not very happy about this, but he keeps fighting anyway. The Nine Years' War doesn't go so well for Louis. You can see that the French Navy is being burned here, and you know Louis is having to basically fight against the combined forces of Europe. And this brings us to the climax of the whole thing, the War of the Spanish Succession, Louis's last, longest, and largest, most important war. And so important, I'm going to address it in a follow-up to this video, so click to keep on watching, and I look forward to continuing with you in just a bit. Thanks for watching so far.